Hello class, I am the instructor that will cover the basic phlebotomy procedures for this course. You can call me Kayla or Miss Van. I am Kayla Van Rickaborsel and I'm happy to have you here in this training program. So first and foremost, we're going to cover the anatomy of the arm for blood draws. There are three veins in the antecubital fossa that we commonly draw from. Our number one choice is the median cubital vein. That's the vein that is in the center of the antecubital fossa, has great flow and less risk for injury. Our number two would be the cephalic vein. That goes along the outer forearm along with your thumb, and that vein is commonly used as well, has a great flow, um, but typically can roll a little bit more. And so anchoring that vein down, which we'll cover in the laboratory, uh, is very crucial for drawing from this vein. That would be number two. Our third option in the arm would be the basilic vein. And as you can see on the slide here on, on slide two, the basilic vein lines up with the ulnar nerve. And so we have to be careful when we draw from that vein just because we don't want to cause any nerve damage or pain for the patient. And so I will explain in the laboratory, but that one is very crucial to have the correct depth and angle of the needle. That way there's less risk to that nerve. On slide three, you'll see a, a chart of the nerves and vessels in the arm. Again, the ulnar nerve uh, is the most commonly um, that that is the most common nerve to have uh, damage from a draw to. And so we'll want to be careful when we draw from the basilic vein. On slide four, you'll see the veins of the forearm. This is just a basic chart here. Again, our number one is the median cephalic. That's right in the middle of the antecubital fossa. Number two would be the cephalic vein, which goes along your thumb line. And our third option would be the basilic vein that goes along with the pinky line. Again, there's nerves in that area, so we try and stay away from them. All right, slide five, we're going to talk about how to apply a tourniquet. This is a big part of phlebotomy. Applying the tourniquet appropriately is key for a successful draw. You want to apply it four to five finger widths above the draw site. And so typically it's a couple inches above the antecubital fossa. Now, depending on how low or high you're drawing, um, you may alter that a little bit and we can demonstrate that in the laboratory for you. But applying the tourniquet is very crucial because you want the correct amount of pressure. You also want to tie it correctly to have a quick release and it will make your draw a lot easier. It'll help pump up the veins, apply that pressure. And then once you get your successful stick, you'll release that. And so the release is also very important and that's where the tying technique is crucial for a blood draw. And I have uploaded a video in module one for you about how to apply a tourniquet. And also I will allow for you to take a tourniquet home. That way you can practice on family members or friends um, because getting down the, the tying technique um, seems intimidating at first, but once you get it down, it's really key to help you get your successful blood draw. On slide seven, you can see here, this is a butterfly needle. There's two types of needles that we use commonly for blood draws. Uh, and this first one here is a butterfly needle. You can see that it has little blue wings and that's why they call it a butterfly. Uh, and so different technique as far as applying this uh, needle to the vein and you go at a different angle. The nice thing about this is you can actually let go of the needle because the wings hold the needle in place and they secure it in the vein. And so typically we use these for pediatrics and for elderly, uh, if veins are small, if a patient, uh, you know, requests a butterfly needle and certain tests, um, sometimes you, you pick the needle dependent on the type of tests you need. I'll show you this in the laboratory. On slide eight, you can see this is a different type of needle. This is a straight stick needle. And um, there's benefits to both, but the straight stick has, has benefits um, in the sense that it is a larger gauge, and so the tubes fill up much faster. Also, the stick is, is different. You go straight in, and um, it typically can cause less pain because you don't have to go as far into the vein with a straight stick needle. Again, I'll demonstrate this in the laboratory for you. A big part of phlebotomy is being prepared, having your supplies out um, and, and being trained appropriately uh, and being very cautious 
and uh, having that uh, safety is a big part of phlebotomy. Obviously, you're, you're dealing with blood, there's blood-borne pathogens, also needles, and so the last thing you want to do is, is poke yourself or hurt a patient or risk either of you. Venipuncture equipment. So each needle is double-pointed, meaning that there's a needle on both ends. One end has a rubber coating on it, and that end is for your vacutainer tubes to go on to. The, that needle has to puncture through the tube in order for the blood to flow into it. The other needle is what goes into the patient's skin, and that does not have a rubber coating on it. Each tube is evacuated. There's stopper tubes, meaning that there's suction. So when you pop a tube on, it's supposed to help suck the blood out and give a better flow. And so I'll demonstrate this for you. Um, and sometimes the tubes don't have an appropriate vacutainer. So uh, if, you, if you think you're in a vein and something's going on with the tube, it's always good to have a backup tube just in case it's a vacutainer issue. The needle holder, which we call a hub, is the plastic device that you twist onto the rubber coated part of the needle. And this secures the tube onto the, onto the rubber sheath, and that is your ho main holding device. Uh, again, I'll demonstrate this for you so you can see, but that's always, you always use a needle holder or hub with every draw you use. Sharps container, very important. Um, obviously with a needle, you want to be extra careful always. Uh, the nice thing is there's safety locks now on every needle, and so I'll teach you that in class. But a sharps container is, is crucial. You need that within hand's reach always whenever you do any draw. That way you're not walking around with a needle. The second you take it out of the patient's arm, you put it in the sharps container as soon as you can. Winged infusion sets, butterfly needles. That was the first picture on slide seven. Uh, obviously looks different uh, than a straight stick needle and I'll demonstrate that for you as well. Sometimes we use syringes for blood draws, and I'll demonstrate that in the lab. Um, it really depends sometimes, uh, especially elderly or if you work in a dialysis clinic, their veins can collapse. And so sometimes the vacutainer suction is, is too much to where it sucks too fast. Therefore, we would do a blood draw out of a syringe, and we'll demonstrate that to you as well. Of course, you're going to need your tourniquet. You'll need a marking pen because labeling the tubes is first and foremost. You always want to make sure you have the correct patient, correct blood. Alcohol swabs, we always need to clean the site. Gauze pads, right after you take the needle out, you need to apply pressure so there's less risk for a bruise or hematoma. Bandages, um, either tape or uh, coban gauze uh, often is used to apply pressure after the draw. And then, of course, gloves. Always need gloves. Here on slide 11, it shows you a picture of a, a commonly used little cart or bucket. Um, often, phlebotomists will carry this around with all their supplies. And again, having those extra tubes nearby if there's an issue uh, is always nice because if you're in a vein, the last thing you want to do is have to get up and grab something. And so having that within reach is nice and that's why we like to use these little buckets. PPE, personal protective equipment. So definitely number one is gloves. Um, most gloves are, are latex free now, um, but we always wanna ask if there's a latex allergy because we do have vinyl um, as well as latex uh, gloves. But it's always important to ask. Most patients will tell you ahead of time, but it's always important to ask if there's a latex allergy. Typically, we like to put gloves on first, but you may palpate the vein if you don't see it immediately and you want to feel first to know that you have an accurate sight and you feel confident within that vein. Uh, you can touch the vein and palpate first and then put your gloves on and then clean and proceed. Here on slide 13, it just shows the, uh, the vacuum needle holder, uh, the tube, rubber stopper, kind of explains things, the rubber sleeve I was talking about, which is the other side of the needle. 
Uh, here, the tip of the needle with the bevel, which is a little hole in the needle, uh, and you always want bevel up, and that will contribute to a successful draw without injury. Slide 14 talks about syringes, and that, again, is used often if geriatric patients especially uh, have problems with veins co collapsing, they're going through dialysis, there's a lot of scar tissue, um, but drawing from a syringe is, is a lot different than using a vacutainer, and we'll cover this in class. Antiseptics, always important. The last thing we wanna do is risk an infection for our patient. And so we always clean uh, the site before doing a draw. And if you need to repalpate when your gloves are on, you clean again after. We always wanna make sure that it's a sterile site. And most of the time we use alcohol. Alcohol pads are standard. However, there's some tests that require a different antiseptic. And so if you're doing a blood alcohol test, for example, if you use an alcohol swab, that can alter the results. And so there's different antiseptics that are appropriate for certain draws and certain tests. Slide 16 talks about evacuated collection tubes. Again, with the vacutainer system, that is a pressure to where it will help the increase of blood flow into the tube. As far as tube additives, every tube is a different color and each color stands for the additive and type of test that you can run through that tube. So you'll notice um, some have a little bit of liquid, which is an additive, um, or they will have a gel barrier, which uh, will, will look thick at the bottom of the tube. And I will explain what that is for and why we use the gel barriers. Uh, we use a centrifuge often when we run tests, and that will separate the serum from the plasma. And certain tests require serum and certain require plasma. Uh, now, if you see that gel barrier, that typically means we're going to use the centrifuge and run those tests uh, through the centrifuge, which is a machine that will spin the blood at a high speed and separate the serum and plasma. A lot of other tubes that have the additives, for example, EDTA, uh, that is a lavender top tube. That one uh, is, is, EDTA is made to not clot the blood. And so it will keep it, uh, keep, keep it as liquid. And that's used for certain tests for chemistry panels or complete blood counts. Uh, you'll commonly use that one as well, but that one does not need to be centrifuged. We'll go over this in lab as well. Here, uh, it's always important to invert uh, your tubes after doing a draw. So once you get the tube full, you will slightly invert up and down and a certain amount of times for certain colored tubes. Most standardly, it's eight to 10 times, uh, but certain tubes require less. On slide 19, you'll see the common order of draw. Every lab is a little different, but this is the standard order of draw. Uh, th this is very, very important. If you do not follow the correct order of draw and say you use a, you can see number seven, EDTA, that's a lavender top. Say you use that first before a red top tube, that can transfer the EDTA to the red tube. And accuracy is very important. So we don't want additives in certain tubes, um, especially if it's transferred. So order of draw is very, very important. I will hand out a little keys for this. And again, depending on the lab you work, they're going to have their, their own system. But this is a standard order of draw. And typically it starts with tubes that don't have additives. That way they're not transferred into other tubes. And then there's a series after that for the ones that do have additives and the order we draw those in. You can see here on slide 21, the different colors of the tubes. So you will have yellow, light blue, red. Your SST can be a marble color, it can be a red and yellow, kind of a combo. That's a common one. Uh, you'll have a 
gray tube or PST, you'll have green, lavender,